Today we're going to talk about uh, f- having fellowship with God. Having fellowship with God. Amen. And I know that uh, a lot of us want to acknowledge, praise God, our visitors that are visiting with us today. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good to see the young man. Praise God. Glad that he's here to be with us. I pray that you, amen, are, are blessed by the services today. We welcome you into this house. A lot of Christians, and I say a lot, probably most Christians don't actually, don't actually have a fellowship with God. And I think that's uh, due in part because most of us don't really know what fellowship is. It's going to be really difficult to do something if you're not aware, don't, you don't understand what it is. Fellowship is more than just coming to church on a, and, and sitting in here. Praise God. As much as I love to see you guys here, this is not, this is not the, the fullness of uh, to define what true fellowship really is. Uh, and we appreciate God. This is a part of our, our reasonable service, but this is, not the, this is not everything that God wants us to do just to be here. Amen. I've made this statement several times, and I think it's to be true. Just because you stand up in your garage doesn't make you a car. Amen. It doesn't. Just like just because we come to church, just because I'm here doesn't mean that I'm a, it doesn't even mean that I'm a Christian just because I'm here. It just means that I had strength in my body to get up this morning to come here. It doesn't, it doesn't just me being here, doesn't identify who I am. Okay, just me being here, neither do, does you being here identify who you are. It doesn't, it doesn't speak for what you're going through. It doesn't speak for what you, what you battled to get here. Even though you might be smiling and some of you may not be smiling. Uh, sometimes our outward, outer expression doesn't really, doesn't really speak what, about what's happening on the inside. Amen. Sometimes our outer expression doesn't accurately speak what's go, really going on on the inner man. Praise God. That a lot of times my wife will look at me and she'll say, what's wrong? You got that, you got that frowning look on your face. Well, I have that look all the time. Okay. So I, I'm like, okay, I think it not strange <laughs> that I might have that that look that I am maybe I'm thinking about something maybe I'm really uh, meditating on something else maybe my mind is in a place to where maybe I'm examining something I'm questioning something I'm reviewing something and a lot of time when I do that I have that wrinkle look wrinkle or wrinkled more look okay <laughs> uh, about myself and just so I know that many times when we come into this place, our outer expression doesn't always express what's happening on the inside. Now, I'm not saying that we're justified in that. I'm not giving us a, uh, an ex- a, an, an, a justification or a reason to continue even in that venue because the Bible tells us how we ought to respond when we come into the house of the Lord. Okay, the Bible says to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Is that what it says? It says enter into his courts with praise. So if I enter into his, his, his house and I'm, I'm expressing anything other than thanksgiving and anything other than praise, then I'm not, I'm not doing it like God told me to do it. Can I just be straight up and be honest with you guys? If I enter, if I do in any way that's outside of what God has already told me, even though my heart may be broken on the inside, I may be bleeding on the inside. I may be uh, as discouraged as and, and battling, uh, wanting to, to give up or to quit or to, do, or to just do something different on the inside. My calling in God doesn't allow me to it doesn't allow me the liberty or the license to not fulfill what God told me to do just because maybe I'm feeling a certain way because the Bible never told us that we're saved that we should operate by our feelings anyway. Are y'all with me? The Bible says we're saved by faith. We walk by faith. We, not by sight. So I'm not, I'm not licensed by God. I don't have his authority. 
to operate on my feelings, how I feel. Didn't feel like coming to church today. Woke up this morning, uh, I don't know, praise God. And uh, when I woke up and my eyes woke, and I had such a great and, a, and, a, and an awesome and a peaceful sleep. When my eyes woke up, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> now, I'm telling you how I felt, okay? But I'm not justified in operating in feelings. But a lot of folks do it. A lot of folks do it. And I understand that many times people operate in feelings, and that is because they have never really had a true fellowship with God. I'm just, can I just be straight up and honest with you? Many people operate in feelings because they have never really had, or they're not walking in. Uh, they don't know the power. They don't know the benefit. They don't know the, 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 the greatness of the rewards that God has for those who walk in fellowship with him. So we, 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 we define fellowship as uh, just having, been, having a friendship I have a, a, a comrade. We, we define fellowship, and in the world, we define fellowship as having a close association with friends, fellowshipping. And these are not untrue, but this is the world's perspective of what fellowship is, okay? The world continues to define fellowship as uh, to have, to share uh, similar or mutual interests. And we think about, you can think about fraternities and sororities. You can think about the different groups, the military vet veterans uh, who fought in wars and military vets. You can think about all these different, when I was in college, there was a group called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Just a bunch of Christians who didn't want to do what the other guys were doing after the game. Christians who didn't mind going to the center of the field and bowing down and praying after the game. The fellowship, and it was because we shared similar interests, okay? And that's, and that's not a bad definition, but that's not truly the definition that God, that God has given us when it comes to fellowship. So I, you guys know I, I dug into the original Greek, and I found that the word fellowship means to, from God's perspective, it means to bind uh, it means to connect. It means to be joined together. Whenever you bind something, you take, you guys, you guys know how to operate with, with super glue or glue, right? You take two pieces that have been separated, torn, or even a, a mug or something, where you drop the glass, you drop the mug, and the, the handle broke off of it. So you get some glue. Uh, they call it fastener. Okay, and you take that fastener and you attach it to the to the, the the mug itself, and you also put a little few drops on the handle. And when you at, when you attach them, you hold them there for a while. And if that fastener is working like it should, then it will connect those two pieces that had been separated. So when God is speaking about having fellowship, He's talking about reconciling man back unto Himself. He's talking about connecting man. He's talking about joining man back into the same uh, condition, into the same uh, 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 position that he had. Do you not realize in the, in the, when God created Adam in the garden, Adam was given authority over everything in the earth? When God created Adam, he gave him authority over everything in the earth, over all the creeping things. The dinosaurs respected Adam. The grizzly bear respected Adam. The tigers respected Adam. Why? Because Adam walked in the place where God, where, where the power and the anointing of God had given him authority over these things. And they, re, they respected Adam for that. And God is saying, I want you to have fellowship with me not, not for all the other reasons that people in the world define fellowship, but I want, you, I want you to have fellowship with me so that we can reconnect so that I can bring you back to that place where Adam once was. Are y'all with me today? Hallelujah. 
Another part of that definition in the, if, in the Greek, and I was hesitant about saying this because I don't want your minds to go to, go to, to any place and stay there too long. Uh, I'm talking about places in the flesh. But one of the words, and I looked at, when you look at it in the original Greek, one of the words that it uses to define fellowship is intercourse. You heard it? Now move on past it, okay? <laughs> intercourse. Uh, it means to know. To know. And when I began looking into this, just, y'all know me, I'm, I'm just like a little mole. I'm, I'm just going to keep digging, digging, digging because I love knowledge. I like knowing. I don't like, it's one of the things that I hate, I've always hated all my life. You ask me a question and I don't know. I don't know. Everything is, I don't know. I don't, what do you know? Praise God. So I, I'll, I, will, I love knowledge, man. I'll dig. And now I began looking at there were a couple of scriptures the Lord brought to my remembrance when he, as he refers to uh, the definition about fellowship concerning to know. And in Genesis chapter 4 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Adam knew Eve, his wife. It didn't mean that he, like I know you, Sister Gertrude, it didn't mean it like that. Somebody asked you, do you know Brother Darius? Yeah, I know Brother Darius. But when it says Adam knew Eve, his wife, it meant that they had had intercourse. You read the scripture. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. Okay? Now, the Bible even speaks about, with, we know that Jesus was born of the virgin, right? Mary. And we believe the, the account that has been given unto us that Mary had never had relationship with a man prior to, uh, to Joseph. But jo and, and you read in the book of Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 25, and it speaks about Joseph and Mary. It says, and, and he knew her not. He knew her not. He knew her not. Now, he's engaged to the woman, okay? So he wasn't talking about natural knowledge. He said, and he knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son, and they called his name Jesus. He had never had, had, never had that type of connection with her until after Jesus was born. Praise God. And the Bible tells us, even in the Old Testament, the Bible says that, speaking about God and his idea of fellowship, he says that uh, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one fellow, shall be one flesh. They twain shall be one flesh, two coming together to make one. Two fellowship, two different mindsets, two different bodies, two different uh, philosophies, two different styles of life coming together as one to make one flesh. Hallelujah. I become one with him. Talking about fellowship with God. Hallelujah. And we used, often use the word uh, <laughs> in, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, Paul writes this. He says, and be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I want to show you guys something. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this to include this in the, in the lesson today, but I guess I will now that I've mentioned, I've mentioned uh, yoke. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Praise God. This is the picture of what a yoke looks like, okay? This is what a yoke looks like. You'll notice in this particular one, there are two different sets, there are two different, uh, uh, I don't know what they call those, I'd say head holders, <laughs> neck holders. <laughs> You, you, you disassemble the, the, uh, the clamps at the top and allow that U-shaped bolt to drop. 
and then you take it and you bring it from the bottom and you attach around the neck of that animal, of that oxen. You attach it around his neck and then you reconnect it back because his head's not going to fit through, that, through the holes. You got to dr disconnect it, disassemble it, and then drop it and then put it around his neck and then reattach it to the yoke assembly. Okay, so when, when Paul writes in that scripture, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, he's talking about becoming one with them. He's talking about becoming one with them. It doesn't mean you can't eat at the same dinner table. It doesn't mean we can't come together when we have family. No, that's, that's not what he's, because Jesus said and he ate with the sinners. So he couldn't have been talking about that when it comes to fellowship, but he's talking about yoked together, being coming one with them, one with their lifestyles, doing what they do, saying what they say. Hallelujah. Don't become unequally yoked together with them. This is, this, those, that yoke assembly is designed to make sure that those oxen go in the same direction. That yoke assembly is designed to make sure that those oxen travel. You don't have one wanting to go this way and the other going that way. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. The, now, the, the stronger of the two is always going to survive. And if I'm, if I'm yoked together with Christ, then I know he's stronger than me. I'm already in a losing battle if I decide to rebel or to fight against him. If I decide to resist him, I've already lost the battle. Hallelujah. So he says, don't become unequally yoked. And he uses the term unequal, unequal, un unbalanced. We, we don't think the same. Where we're trying to get to is not the same place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Don't become unequally yoked. Doesn't mean you can't talk with people because you, you have to talk to folks to get them saved. Are y'all with me? Hallelujah. Jesus spoke this in, in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, he says uh, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden. He said, I'll give you rest. Okay? And he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As I began, I was begin hearing this lesson. We were in the hotel last weekend. <laughs> I began hearing this lesson. I was just, you, God just talked to you at all the, some of the strangest places. Woke up, I guess it was Sunday, woke up Sunday morning. I just, I woke up Sunday morning and this word was in my heart, on my mind, in my heart. So I grabbed my laptop and immediately began studying. <laughs> Hallelujah. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. And he began speaking to me about, uh, about, he took me to a couple of scriptures where one of them was where Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Okay, and they follow me. My sheep know my voice. And I was watching a, a video by uh, a young lady, uh, Priscilla Shower. And she gave me a, a, some additional understanding about what happens uh, when the shepherds, when Jesus uh, and was speaking about, he taught often about shepherds, and he, she began to explain about a sheepfold, what a sheepfold was. In John chapter 10, I think it is, Jesus began to teach, and he says, uh, what is it? He said, all that ever came before me were thieves and robbers. Okay, he said, but they didn't, they didn't have, they didn't, they didn't have a love like I have for the sheep. He says, I am the door to the sheepfold. And if any, if any man would come in any other way, other than go, coming in through the door, he's a thief and a robber. Okay, he said, by me, if any, if you want to get in, you've got to, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. Hallelujah. And, 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 she made me, and she made me go back and do some research and some study on the sheepfold. And everything she said was true. The sheepfold was a, 
was like a, a pasture outside and it had a wall, a brick wall essentially about so high. And it was just like these walls go up eight feet. They don't go, they, the sheepfold didn't go up that high. It had to be exposed to the, to the outer elements. But it was wide enough to incorporate hundreds or more of sheep to allow them to, to spend their night in that place to sleep, to rest, to graze. And there was one entry. And she was telling the story about how that uh, oftentimes there were more than one shepherd who would bring their sheep to graze at these particular sheepfolds. And how that uh, one person who's designated who was called the porter was the one who was responsible for sitting at the gate and making sure that the sheep were, you know, were, there was no wolves coming in, no coyotes coming in to try to take advantage of the sheep. Praise God and how that, and then the next day when all the shepherds, after they'd gone home and slept in their comfortable, comfortable beds, they came back the next day to gather their sheep. And you guys, have, I've shown you guys the video of how this shepherd, with his voice, the kids were trying to imitate the shepherd. And even though they tried to imitate the shepherd, they said what he said, but the sheep kept on grazing. The sheep never picked up their heads to, to respond to them. But when those sheep heard that shepherd's voice, they immediately lifted up their head and said, looking for the shepherd. And this is what Jesus is talking about. Fellowship, when you become one with me, when, when we're one, he said, you're going to know my voice. You're going to know the voice of the Spirit of God. And, you're not, and you won't only know it, you will also obey it. Oh, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Oh, I got a rough crowd here today. I got a rough one here. We got a rough one today, Father. Help us, Jesus. The fellowship that God requires, the fellowship with God requires a loss to yourself. It requires, it's, it's not a request. If, you, if, you, if we want to have fellowship with God, it's going to demand that we lose self. Now everybody, and I say that, and, and, and I know what happens I know what happens in our, in our minds when you hear that. The mind, uh, the, the, the carnal mind is going to immediately offer up some objection. The natural mind is going to always, it's going to, it's going to offer up something. How far is he going with this? <laughs> Just how, how, what does he mean by loss of self? I am not, I am not. How, how you sisters do that? I, I can't shake my head like y'all. Y'all do the little neck thing or whatever you do to, to show that I'm not here. I'm not hearing nothing you got to say. <laughs> but if we want to have true fellowship with God, it's going to require us to lose our to lose self. I'm thinking about Paul made a statement in one of his letters to epistles to the, one of the churches. Paul said, "It is no more I, but it's Christ that lives in me." It's no longer I, but it's Christ. now what you see, it's what's happening, it's, it's, this is not me. I'm not focusing anymore on pleasing myself. My focus now, my agenda now is to please, Jesus said this also. He said, I didn't come to do my own will. He said, I came to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Praise God. So if we're going to have fellowship, any of us are going to have fellowship with God, we have to have that mind to lose ourself. Paul wrote to the church, at, at the, to the Philippian church and said, let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and he took upon himself the form of a servant and he humbled himself even to death, the death on the cross. He lost all sight of it. All he, he, he cast down every unction that was going to lift self up. 
That's what humility is. That's what, humi- that's what being humble is. It's casting down every thought. How did Paul say this to the church at Corinth? Paul said how that, uh, oh, Jesus, how that the word of God is casting down imaginations and every high thought that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and then bringing into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. Hallelujah. The power of God, the Holy Ghost, when you submit yourself to God, uh, every, every one of those wayward thoughts, those, those thoughts of, man, I sure do miss, boy, I sure do miss finger popping. I sure do miss my Bacardi. Man, I, oh, yeah. When you hit me, you have those thoughts, man. The Spirit of God will cast down those thoughts. Yes, he will. He'll ca- he will cast them. He will separate those thoughts as far from us as the east is from the west. And then when he, when he separates those thoughts from us, don't go back and pick them up. Don't go back, don't go back and pick them up. And, and a lot of us do that, man. We, we, we'll obey God for a quick moment. We will obey God. Listen, how many of you driving on the interstate slow down when, just when you see the cops and when you, when you don't see the cops no more, you get back on it? And we treat God the same way. I'll obey you as long as I can see you. I'll obey you as long as I feel like you're there to, to threaten or, to, or to, to, to enforce my, my disobedience. Thank you. Say that again. He's always there. I remember years ago, I'm talking about in the 70s. So we would really, man, we used to, Back in the, well, I guess y'all do now. I don't do it like that anymore. But back in the 70s, we, 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 everybody had a CB radio. And the whole purpose of the CB radio was to call the, the good buddies coming from where you was going to get a, to get a smoky report. <laughs> I want to get a smoky report. What's it look like over your back door, good buddy, man? You're clean and mean, clean and mean back to Lake Charlie Town. All right, brother, I'm getting ready to put the hammer down. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to put the hammer down. That's, and, and, but the, the, the cops in that Baton Rouge area got smart. Baton Rouge, New Orleans, between Baton Rouge, New Orleans area on the lakefront there, they got smart. They started patrolling with helicopters. You'd be out on I-10, leaving Baton Rouge, going to New Orleans, crossing the the, the train, and and you didn't know. And when you got on the other side, all of a sudden there was ten or twelve state troopers parked there, and you're like, "How did they clock me?" Because they had the eye in the sky. They were clocking you, and they were radioing ahead. Pull over that green, uh, <laughs> that green uh, Chevrolet. He was doing, he, they give him the speed and everything. And then, so then I began to, since the CB wasn't working it, for that, I really began uh, driving and looking up to see, <laughs> see if I could see a helicopter patrolling. And they would warn you, coming into Baton Rouge, they'd warn you, helicopters, are, you know, on patrol, patrol to enforce the speed. They'd tell you. And God, but God doesn't want us to be like that. God doesn't want us to just be a people who obey him. I just say when the cat's, at, when the cat's away, the mouse are going to play. That's not the mindset God wants us to have. That's not the mindset of someone who has had true fellowship with God. Hallelujah. Jesus said this, if a man wants to, to be my disciple, he must first deny who? himself deny himself to deny means to restrain especially from indulgence in ungodly pleasures deny yourself the old man the old mind is always going to be there we're never going to we're never going to escape you're breathing you're walking you're living in this in this fleshly uh, uh, tabernacle you're going to always for the to, for the rest of your days you're going to be in a battle with the desires of the flesh. Okay, you get saved, you get filled with the Holy Ghost. The difference is you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you, now you have the power to overcome those desires. 
It doesn't say getting filled with the Holy Ghost doesn't say that you're never going to be tempted. It's just that now I have power over this temptation. I've got power to stop cussing. I don't cuss no more. I don't care how angry or upset I might get in a situation. Cuss words are not, go, not going to come out of my mouth because they're no longer in me. I've been delivered from that. I've got power over that. Praise God. Doesn't mean I'm not going to be tempted. Doesn't mean that when somebody cut me off in traffic, the thought comes, boy, don't you? No. I'm a new creature. Doesn't mean I'm not going to be tempted. It just means that with the temptation, he's given me a way to escape. Oh, yes, he is. Come on, somebody. With the temptation, I now have a way to escape and I'll be able to bear it. And I won't get caught in that trap. And then had gotten to feel condemned after the fact. Who lordy. Jesus. Philippians chapter 3. Y'all turn there with me if you don't mind. Philippians chapter 3. Self always stands in the way of our relationship with God. That's, 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 that's what he does. It wants only what someone can do for it and never wants it, never what it can do for anyone else. <laughs> What's in it for me? Y'all ever hear that before? What's in it for me? I'll give my life to you, Jesus, but what's in it for me? Suffering. I'll give my life to you, Jesus, but what's in it for me? Hardness. I give my life to you, Jesus, but what's in it for me? And, and, you, and, 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 and you, you hear the, the, the hardness and the suffering and all these things look bigger than the eternal life that you're going to receive. The sufferings and the, the hardness looks bigger. They speak louder than you receiving a, a crown of righteousness. Hallelujah. The hardness and the suffering speak louder, it seems like, than uh, the peace and the joy that we, that we have uh, in having fellowship with him. Amen. Did you want a Bible, brother? Did you want a Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 7 says this. And Paul is testifying, man. He's testifying about... Uh, his life, his fellowship, his commune with the Father, and, and what, he, what he came to understand that he, he needed to do in order to, to maintain that relationship. He said, but what things were gained to me, the things that were important to me, the things that I thought that were valuable, he said, I, those I counted loss for Christ. I used to think trying to be hip and cool. I used to think that was the thing. Man, that, those days of vanity are gone. Amen. And somebody gonna say, that's cause you're too old. No, they got old fools out there trying to, still trying to be cool. You, 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 got, you, got, you got some folks, some fools older than me still out there trying to be a little, like a little sugar daddy or something. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. So, it's, so age is not the thing that cancels out the desire to do sinful things. De being delivered by the power of God is the thing that delivers us from the desire to want to do evil things. You don't ever get too old to sin. You don't never get too old to lust. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But Paul said, he said, the things that were gained to me, I wanted, I loved recognition. I loved having my, I love being the man. I am, this is, I am the man. I, I, pray, I lived in a time in my life, I loved being the man. Praise God. But you got to give up wanting to be the man if you want to be a disciple of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. You have to take all of that, these things that bring vanity, the things that bring ego, the things that bring pride, you got to put them on the bench. 
You don't want you don't want these things in the game. Come on, somebody. You got to put those things on the bench. Hallelujah. And this is what Jesus is saying. This is what Paul is saying here. Everything that I had about myself that made me feel like Mr. Big Stuff. I put, I took that, I, I did it. I put it on, I, I counted it as loss for Christ. Y'all hearing me? He says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency. And, and I've, I'm not just exchanging what I had or who I, who I thought I was for nothing in return, but I'm, I've got something that's, that, that's reciprocating. Something's coming back to me because I've given these things up. There is something, there is a reward for me giving these things up. He says, I've counted these things uh, but lost, but now I'm attaining unto the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Hallelujah. A lot of you are not growing because you're not, you're still carrying dead self around. Dead baggage. Dead baggage. A lot, of, a lot of you are not growing, praise God, because you're still carrying self around with you. Everywhere you go, every time you pray. You can't even pray because self is sitting there telling you what to, telling you how long to pray, what to say. Don't you want to get up? Aren't your knees hurting? What, didn't you pray this yesterday? <laughs> didn't, self, self is not going to leave you just because you're praying. He's going to be there to interject his own will. We... And I know, I know that, you know, sometimes it's short notice, and I understand that. And this is not about anybody. And I know we have other things, and people have jobs and stuff like that. But we're having prayer on Saturday afternoons periodically. And it's not a fixed thing. But as I really, as I really hear from God, you need to bring the people together. For, and he's told me you need to get them together because I want a fellowship with them. And many of us are too, we're just too self-centered to come together for prayer for one hour. We're too self-centered. And, I know, and I'm not talking about anybody in particular. Because I know, especially if you have events, Sean had to work yesterday, had to cut five yards. <laughs> and they cut, praise God. But some of us are too self-centered. But yet we say we want fellowship. Now something is not lining up. Something is not lining up. How can you say you want God, but when God says, I'm over here, come get me, and you say, I ain't got time. How, how, how's that working? I'm too busy doing this. Paul said, I counted everything but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Praise God. We, 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 you don't, you don't, ha you haven't counted everything but loss for the excellency of Christ and you won't go home and study this lesson after church is over. You have not. Right, I, it was a sacrifice getting up. Please. It was a blessing to get up. Are y'all hearing me? Hallelujah. The Lord spoke something to me on yesterday. He said, he said don't, be, don't be congratulating yourself just because you've done the will of the Lord. He said, because all you've done was your reasonable service. <laughs> I said, yes, sir, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You don't, you, don't, you don't get no pat on the back for doing what Jesus said. I didn't come, I didn't come here for that. He said, I, can't, he said I'm just, I came here to do his will. Hallelujah. You have not counted it loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ if you're not willing to. And I got a note here. Let me finish reading this that Paul said before I get to that. He says, then he says, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. When you have really come into fellowship with Christ, you're going to have similar situations to happen in your life. People are going to leave you. A lot of the friends who were doing the dirt with you, because you're not doing the dirt anymore, they're not going to want to hang around with you. You don't even have to ask them to leave. 
they leave because they they themselves don't be don't want to be unequally yoked together with you. <laughs> they don't. He says, "For whom I've lost, for, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung." What is dung? He said, I counted it all, but poo-poo. It, 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 it smells, it stinks to me now. Are y'all hearing me? Sinful lifestyle ought to stink to you. If sinful lifestyles don't stink to you, then you don't know God. I got to say it again. If a sinful lifestyle, I didn't, say, I didn't say you had overcome it. I didn't say you had, had mastered uh, how to, to walk in victory over it, but at least it ought to stink to you. At the very least, people cussing ought to bother you. At the very least. Why? Because it's not, it's not, that's not an example of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. People, people that call, and I, I'm going to say that, I'm not going to talk down about them, but there are Christians who think nothing at all about watching rated R movies and TV shows. That's, just, that's stuff, at the very least, some of these things ought to just disgust you. Why? Because of the spirit of God that's pure and holy on the inside of you. Are y'all hearing me? F having fellowship with God brings you to that place. And when, you ha when, you, when you've had the fellowship with God and when you compare it to the fellowship you had in the world and the thing the world does, what they're doing, in all honesty, doesn't even compare. Now, this is, this is my testimony, Okay. What the world is doing, it doesn't even compare. Hallelujah. Because my mind has been changed. My mind has been changed. Ooh, Lordy. He says, and to be found, he said, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. That I may win Christ. And to be found in him. Man, where you been? Man, I've been in Jesus. Man, I ain't seen you at I ain't seen you at the at the at the at the at the at the dew drop in. <laughs> I hadn't seen you at the dew drop in a while. No, you ain't gonna see me. Cause you know why? Because I'm in Christ now. Come on, somebody. Man, I ain't seen you, man. You used to you used to come by the tree, and man, oh, man, I ain't got time for the tree. <laughs> I ain't got time. I ain't got time for the tree. I'm in Christ now. My mind is, my heart's, my my I'm, my mind. I think about different things now. I don't think like I used to think. He said, and being found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, and that's something totally different right there. I had made notes about it, but that's not what I want to cover today. He says, which is of the law, but that which is through, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. This is what I wanted to get to. Paul's talking about fellowship, okay? He says that I may know him. That I may know him. I've, kind of, I've given up all this stuff because I want to become one with Christ. Hallelujah. Go back and ask your, your old worldly partners. Man, I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking about giving my life to God, man, but I, wanted, I just wanted to do a little check before I left you. I want to check, say, what, what you got that's good for me? Ask some of your old worldly relationships. What you got to offer me to stay out here in the world? Ask them. Ask any of them. Make them ask them. Hey, you know, man, yeah, man, we had, did we have fun, you know, two months ago? Did we have fun at the Christmas party? Didn't we have fun? But what you got to offer me other than uh, 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 getting drunk and 
DUI or something from, from, from being at the, at the Christmas party. Come on, man. What you got to offer me, dude? You, 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 you don't want to come to Christ with me. You got, all, you got objections to our lifestyles. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to walk in the straight right now, okay? I'm trying to walk in the straight. But you keep coming over here bringing things that's going to take me from the straight. You keep coming over here offering me things that are going to take me away from Jesus Christ. You keep coming over here, now you're disrupting the time when I ought to be praying, when I ought to be studying. And you want to, now you want to go ride around town. What are what, what we riding around town for? Why don't you ride with me to church? I ask them that. Hey, won't you, you want to ride? Why don't you ride with me to church Sunday morning? Ooh. He said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Hallelujah. The power of his resurrection. How many of us really know and are walking in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You're not going to know the power unless you spend time with him. You won't. There's a, you know, nowadays when you, if you want to, uh, say you got online banking or whatever, I got an account with Fidelity Investments. If I want to access my account with Fidelity Investments, I, I've accessed that online so much that I know my username and my password by heart. I don't need no little notes to remind me. I, I've accessed it. If I want to check my account at Chase, I know I've been there often enough that when I want to go and look and see or transact any kind of business, I don't need to pull up, you know, my little, pull out my little cheat sheet. No, because I go there often enough. And God is wanting to know, he's wanting us to know that if you will come here often enough, if you will, just, if you will come and familiarize yourself with me, there are things that are going to feel almost automatic. Amen. You wonder why things don't feel automatic to you? It's because you're not going there often enough. Amen. Every time you go, once every two weeks you go, I got to go back and pull up my little cheat sheet and say, oh, what's, what's my password? And, then, and they didn't... If you, don't go, if you don't go after a certain period of time, they, they cancel your access, and then you got to go back and reset your password to start all over again. I don't, I, I, I'm not going to be like that with my father. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not going to. You can, if you want, if that's the life you want, if you're happy that way, then go on with it. I, couldn't, I ain't find no happiness in that. I ain't, they ain't find no peace in that. I ain't, find, I ain't find no joy in that. Hallelujah. He said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. I wanted to be so that when I'm tempted, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points. Isn't that what the Bible said? It said he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Do you know why? Because he was always before his father's face. He would sneak away from the disciples and sneak away. And when they were asleep, he'd sneak, sneak off into a, a, a private place, go into the woods, go hide in the mountains somewhere. And he'd go, he would go to pray. Hallelujah. People think, Sister Fader, you retired. You retired from work. You ain't got nothing to do. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, yes. My day ain't just filled with just sitting back watching... <laughs> The price is right. <laughs> so Dorothy, I've got to pray. I have to spend time talking to my father. I, I thought you retired. I retired from working in the refinery, yes but I'm not retired from God. Hallelujah. 
Every now and then, somebody will call me, and I don't answer the phone because when, when, when I'm in that place where I'm not wanting to be disturbed, I turn the phone off. Turn the ringer off. I'm not answering no calls because right now my communication with God, this is what's taking priority. Hallelujah. This is what's taking priority. Much as I love fishing, I, I, don't, I will never, I will never enjoy catching a fish more than I, being, than I enjoy being caught by God. I will never enjoy catching a fish more than I enjoy being caught by God. Hallelujah. Praise God. He said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. There's that word fellowship, becoming one, becoming one with the sufferings of Christ. I mentioned this in last Wednesday night's lesson. When it comes time, when, God's, when God brings us, we all, we're all right, just lead me to the rock, Lord, that's higher than I. Lead me, lead me, Lord, lead me, Lord. When, when it, when you get, then when you bring you to that place where that wilderness is there and you're going to be tempted, it's like, oh, no, Lord, be it far, be it far from me. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Be it far from me, Lord. Oh, no. Hallelujah not realizing that we also are going to, listen, this is the place where you grow. This is the, ooh, Jesus. No, 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 I see y'all going, see, see how y'all do it? I'm going to have to show you something. I got to show you. Well, it's, it's in Deuteronomy, I think it is, but I'm going to find it. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, Jesus. Mm -hmm. come, on, come on, somebody give the Lord a hand clap, if you would, while I'm, uh, uh, while I'm finding this, uh, this uh, scripture. Praise God, praise God. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I want to begin reading at verse number 1. Praise God. See, a lot of y'all are, are neglecting the benefit of the fellowship just because you got to go through a little something. Paul said the suffering of this present time. Is it okay if I just tell you what the word of God says? He said the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Ain't no glory going to be revealed in your life if you're not willing to take on the whole armor of God. And that includes the sufferings. Verse number one, all of the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do that you may live. I'm giving these commandments to you not to put you in bondage, not to make you mad, but I'm giving you these commandments so that you might live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. He says, and thou shalt remember, don't forget the lesson that I'm trying to teach you. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness his purpose for bringing you where he brought you was to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. You all understand what he's saying there? Anybody, and I know y'all probably didn't, but I've known some folks who, who have, who do and who have, they raised pit bulldogs. They raise them to, to breed and to sell, to make money. Praise God. And they, they, ain't, they ain't trying to sell no dog that won't fight. Are y'all hearing me? If the word get around, man, can't, don't buy another Ken dog. Man, Ken dog won't fight. Ken dog will run when they see, when they see another dog. I'm out of business. <laughs> I'm out of business. And God, God said, I brought you this way to prove you. 
I want to see if you, well, how, how, are you going to stand up when you face adversity or are you going to turn tail and run? I brought you this way to humble you, to show you that, how did Peter say this? I think it's in Peter. He said, humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you in due time because God resisteth the proud but gives grace unto the humble. Okay? He said, I brought you this way to humble you. I brought you this way to show you that I am greater than anything that you ever going to, or anyone that you ever going to know. I'm the biggest and the baddest and I'm the best. He said, to prove, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart. The problem with a lot of us is that we don't know our own heart posture. Anybody ever heard that term before, heart posture? Sister Michelle, I know you have, haven't you? What does that word, what does that mean when you talk about heart posture? What does that mean? Your attitude toward the Lord. Oh, man. What's your attitude toward God? What is your attitude toward the Lord? Do you respect him as a father? Do you respect him as the creator? Do you love him more than you love? Like he asked Peter, he said, Simon, do you love me more than you love these fish? What's your heart posture when it comes to the Father? What is your heart posture when it comes to the kingdom of God? The two things I understand that that, that that term speaks to. It speaks to the position of your heart, and it also speaks to the condition of your heart. It speaks about where you are, but it also speaks about the health, the healthiness of that position. And a lot of folks are, a lot of folks are not in a healthy place. Their heart posture is, is not, a healthy, not a healthy place for them. I want my heart to be in a healthy place, man. Are y'all hearing me today? He said, I, wanted to, I, want to prove, I want you to know what was in your heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. He, I, I brought you through, God I brought you through all these situations to accomplish this. I want to prove the integrity of my power in you. Are y'all hearing me? So I'm going to allow you to, I'm going to, allow you to go, go through a few things. But don't be, dis, don't be dismayed and don't, don't be afraid because I'm going to be with you all the way through it. This is, this is the thing that gives me comfort. This is the thing that gives me comfort knowing that no matter what I go through, God is with me. Hallelujah. No matter what I have to endure, God is with me. Praise God. Somebody say, order my steps, Lord. Just ask himself, order my steps, Lord. It may not be what you wanted. It may not look like what you asked for, but God will always give you what you need. I was in prayer a couple of days ago. I was in prayer a couple of days ago, and I heard somewhere in my, in my remembrance, I heard I saw some things that I had done long, even long before I even left Lake Charles, and I felt so bad about those things that I had done. And I began to cry and pray and say, God, help me, Lord Jesus. I know you've forgiven. I believe you've forgiven me. But just, just even the remembrance of some of the things that I've done and some of the things that I did, it, just, it has made me so, feel so like how could, I, how could I ever have done these things even after I had come to know you? Even after I'd come to know you, I knew you, knew your power. And I find myself still in a place where I did things that I knew were wrong. Praise God. And I began to cry, I began to weep, I began to cry, I began to weep. I said, Lord, forgive me. And I, and I was asking him to forgive. I know God has forgiven. I know he has. But, but, but just the thought of it, just the remembrance of it, and sometimes God will, God will let me see these things. This is for my benefit, and I believe this. This is not to, make me, not to make me feel bad, but just to remember where you came from. Just to remember where I brought you from. Just to remember how, how I've, del I want you to see how I've delivered you. Deliverance is not going to come if we're not willing to suffer. My last point here, I'm going to let you guys go. 